Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this final afternoon of the IAC 2008 Congress. This is a session that's open to the public. Uh, any of you who don't, still don't know me after this week, I'm Richard Brooke uh, and as chair of the International Programme Committee, I'm very pleased with the events that we have had so far this week. There have been over 3,000 people at this Congress. Um, from heads of space agencies to politicians to space professionals and to members of the public now here on this afternoon. During this week we've had a good look at the reality of space uh, in the present day and pr some prospects for the future but stealing from our highlight lecture last night I'm going to say that on this last afternoon we're going to return to imagination. The Congress is titled From Imagination to Reality and we're going to go back to imagination and to look at what it is that drives us out into space. We're going to cover science fiction and the romance of space travel and space travel as a canvas for fiction and storytelling and imagination. We're going to cover the prospects for you and I maybe to go to near space quite soon as tourists and we're going to ask a panel of professional astronauts and cosmonauts what it's like to be up there on the International Space Station. But I'm not going to do most of the talking this afternoon. As you can hear, my voice is uh, nearly finished. I've asked a couple of people from the Young Professionals Group to help me. And I'd like to introduce Kevin Stube and Jessica Culler from the NASA Ames Research Center to come onto the stage uh, they're members of the Space Generation Advisory Council and they're going to uh, moderate this afternoon's discussions and question sessions. I'd like to make this as much of a conversation with the audience this afternoon as is possible. So if you have a question, please stick your hand up and don't be afraid to ask it any time. There are microphones you will see in the aisles and there will be a lady uh, running around the um, auditorium here with a handheld mic. Thank you. So, Kevin, over to you. Would you like to introduce our first speaker, or are you going to do it, Jessica? Jessica, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our first panelist and presenter for the day is Dr. Stephen Michael Baxter from Liverpool, England. He's a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, Vice President of the British Science Fiction Association, and a Vice President of the H.G. Wells Society. In the last 21 years, he's published over 40 books, mostly science fiction novels, and over 100 short stories. His science fiction novels have been published in the UK, the US, and many other countries, including Germany, Japan, and France. His books have won several awards, including the Philip K. Dick Award, the John W. Campbell Memorial Award, the British Science Fiction Association Award, the Kurt Laschwitz Award from Germany, and the Seelen Award from Japan. He's been nominated for several others, including the Arthur C. Clarke Award, the Hugo Award, and Locus Awards. He's published over 100 sci-fi short stories, several of which have won prizes. Stephen applied to become a cosmonaut in 1991, aiming for the guest slot on Mir, which was eventually taken by Helen Sharman. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Michael Baxter. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I've got to apologize for my voice as well. It's a, it's a, a cold, a French cold, but a cold. Um, uh, yes, thank you for that kind of introduction. Um, uh, uh, this, the slogan of the, of, of the uh, Congress is from, from imagination to reality. <clears throat> and that's what I want to speak about today, uh, with science fiction as one, as one pole of the imagination end of that uh, equation, and space engineering as the other end. But I don't think from imagination to reality captures the truth, really. To me, it's a, a kind of ping-pong game. It's an interaction, a feedback process between the two. Why do I use the word ping-pong as an analogy? Because that was Arthur C. Clarke's favorite sport, at least towards the end of his life. And well, we lost Arthur this year, didn't we? And I had to correct your um, introduction on one point, which is that I'm now the president of the British Science Fiction Association, not the vice president, because succeeding Arthur. Uh, so there you are. I think I'd rather, rather have Arthur back. Um, so, uh, um, so, so I want to talk about a century then of, of from, the, from the founding of modern science fiction um, to the present day, 
to try to show how science fiction and the, the engineering and scientific vision of space and our future in space have evolved together. Now, I've got absolutely no special effects except for this tortoise um, and books. And that's not me being cheap. It's a deliberate strategy, actually. I mean, I, I, I'd like to, to uh, try to argue that a book like this, at least some books, are just as significant in our culture as, as the, the magnificent engineering which was on display in the exhibition hall earlier. And this book you'll see is H.G. Wells's, I hope you can see, H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds. Not a first edition, but it's a nice penguin edition with uh, Martian time machine, uh, fighting machines stalking across the, the Surrey landscape. Um, one of the founding texts of modern science fiction, although the origins of science fiction are, are another debate. Um, Wells, in, in, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, the basic story. Uh, the Earth, specifically southern England, is invaded by uh, Martians. Predatory, voracious, bl literally blood-sucking Martians who are not interested in communication at all. They come to take our planet and to take us. Now, in this book, Wells was attempting many things. It's a, it's a parable about colonialism, which hit home with the late Victorian uh, empire builders. Uh, it's e an evolutionary saga. Wells was very hot on evolution, having been taught by Huxley, one generation, generation away from Darwin. Um, and it, throughout his writing, Wells would again and again show species coming into conflict, not really in, in, in wars, but in conflicts that would end in the extermination of one side or another, very Darwinian. Uh, conflicts. And indeed, the artillery man in the War of the Worlds says this isn't a war any more than there's war between men and ants. However, it is, of course, a book about space travel and life on other worlds. And where did Wells get his basic idea from? From the reality, as it was then understood, of Mars. Uh, the book was published in 1897, so only 20 years after Schiaparelli, the Italian uh, astronomer, believed he saw a network of lines on the surface of Mars, optically. He called them canali, which meant channels, but Percival Lowell, the American astronomer, spun out those observations into a, a terrific hypothesis of, of, a, of a civilization on Mars. I mean, it was believed that the further from the sun you were, the older your world was, and the, but also the, the more advanced uh, 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 an intelligent race would be. So Lowell imagined um, a, a, a technologically advanced race on a cold, arid, dying Mars unifying politically to build a, a network of irrigation canals. In one of his schemes, there was 437 canals, many of them 5,000 kilometers long. And this is the Mars which inspired Wells uh, to uh, uh, found his fiction. I'll, there's a short passage in here which I'll read, which could have come straight out of um, uh, uh, Lowell's science. Um, since Mars is older than our Earth, with scarcely a quarter of the superficial area remoter from the Sun, it necessarily follows that it's any more distant, uh, is, is it not only more distant from life's beginning, but nearer its end. That secular cooling that must someday overtake our planet has already gone far indeed with our neighbor. Its air is much more attenuated than ours, its oceans have shrunk, and as, as its slow seasons change, huge snow caps gather and melt about either pole and periodically inundate its temperate zones. That last stage of exhaustion, which is to us still incredibly remote, has become a present-day problem for the inhabitants of Mars. The immediate pressure of necessity has brightened their intellects, enlarged their powers, and hardened their hearts. And so they come to take our younger, warmer Earth. Um, I, I, I suspect you're all familiar with War of the Worlds, but um, you may not be so familiar with this book. This is Two Planets by Kurt Laswitz, a German writer. He was actually a mathematics professor from Jena in Germany. Published in the same year as Wells' book, based on the same premise of the Lowellian Mars and inhabited Mars. Um, uh, but as you can see, I hope, that it, it, there are no fighting machines here. This is a Martian, a beautiful lady floating around ethereally. And the story here is that um, uh, 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 Martians on Earth are discovered by two German explorers. They're heading for the North Pole by balloon. If you remember, the pole hadn't been reached by uh, uh, in, 19, in 1897. What they find there is not just ice, but a Martian base. And there's a space station suspended over the pole and up along the axis. And the Martians have come here by anti-gravity in this case. Uh, it, it's terrific. And unlike Wells, Laswitz's Martians are benevolent. Um, they've, they've reached a kind of utopian state on their own planet. They've banished need and hunger through technology. 
Um, they draw power directly from the sun and they can synthesize food from inanimate objects, rocks to bread. And they've ended conflict through the betterment of the individual through education, which is a very 19th century dream, sort of Immanuel Kant and so on. So the utopian Martians have come to the earth um, to help us really, to uplift us uh, into their utopian state. Also though, they're a bit colonial, they want to harvest our sunlight and, and, and so on. And the story is interesting, which things don't go all that smoothly, because from the beginning, some of us fear that we're, uh, uh, um, uh, even though friendship is not, is not necessarily a good idea, the friendship of the Martians appears da dangerous to me, the en enmity appears disastrous. And now you've got to remember this is a book written by a German. In the story, um, things go wrong when the British, a British warship opens fire on a Martian airship, an anti-gravity airship. Uh, so w war ensues anyway between Mars and the Earth because of the British, it was all our fault. But in the end, we make peace and you have united humanity, united Martians. We join together in a sort of interplanetary, technological and moral utopia. Um, this, it's, so it's kind of utopian fantasy in the end. And it was banned by the Nazis for being too pacifist, which is, which is a, you know, quite a qualification, I think. should be on the cover. Well, it wasn't... Trend, there, there was a kind of parochialism in science fiction, unfortunately, where there's very little translation between uh, uh, different languages. So um, this wasn't translated, in fact, into English until 1971. So it wasn't too well known um, uh, in the Anglophone world. But Arthur C. Clarke knew about it, and I'm going to be mentioning Nick Clarke's name a few times this, this afternoon. He spoke to the BIS in 1950. He, of course, he was central to the development of the BIS itself. He said, as far as I know, Laswitz's book has not been translated into English, which is a great pity, as it's one of the most important of all interplanetary romances. Not only did it include such ideas as anti-gravity, but explosive propulsion systems, repulsors, the word later used by the German Rocket Society to describe its own early rockets, and most surprising of all, space stations. All these details were worked out with great care by the author, who was a professor of mathematics at Jena. Okay, so um, what influence did these books have? Well, so here, this is the ping pong ball going back and forth. I started with Lowell's Mars. Across comes the ball to the science fiction writers who spin out these great fantasies. Um, Two Planets was not well known in, 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 in uh, the English speaking world, but it was very popular in Germany for several decades. And among those who were influenced by it was, was Werner von Braun who I'm sure you know that name, he was the, uh, before the war he was a German rocket pioneer and experimenter. During the war he worked for the Nazis on the V2 program um, and then led the American uh, Apollo moon program. Uh, the Saturn V was very much a technological descendant of the V2, so a very significant figure. And he was influenced by two planets. And in fact he gave an epigraph to this 1971 edition, which says, I shall never forget how I devoured this novel with curiosity and excitement as a young man. And I believe that reading it today, in the 1970s, will be of enhanced interest when electronic and human eyes have already gathered the first direct impressions of the moon and our neighboring planets. We may also realize what fascinating possibilities are opening up for the generations of the 21st century, when through the expansion of the universe, our dreams and fancies will become real realities. Werner von Braun. Meanwhile, Wells was inspiring, among others, Robert Goddard, Robert Goddard was an American rocketry pioneer. Um, he, I think in his lifetime he was not as well appreciated as Von Braun turned out to be. But many of his uh, innovations, uh, fuel pumps, uh, self-cooling rocket motors and so forth, ended up being crucial in the, in the effort that uh, took men to the moon. He was six when the War of the Worlds was serialized in the Boston Post. I think it was a pirated serialization actually, but I, well, I'll let that pass. Um, and he said in his diary later, he said, it gripped my imagination tremendously. Wells' wonderfully true psychology made the thing very vivid. Um, he, he climbed a cherry tree in his backyard and he imagined how wonderful it would be to make some device which had even the possibility of ascending to Mars. When I descended the tree, existence at last seemed very purposive. I mean, he must have been a very serious little six-year-old boy. Um, however, you, you can see what's happening here. It's, there are visions in these books of, of travel between Mars and the Earth. How are you going to do it? Um, Wells' as Martians were fired out of a cannon. Well, that's not going to work. Jules Verne tried the same trick. Um, the Martians in Last Witter's book had anti-gravity. Well, that's too far beyond us, on the other hand. M rockets, though, rockets. Maybe rockets are the way to do it. So you have the dream planted. See the ping-pong ball going back again. The dream is planted, and the rocket pioneers try to find ways to make it uh, a, a reality. So after, 
um, decades more development, and I suppose by the end of the war, surely the potential of the uh, rockets as a device for interplanetary travel was well established. You have new fantasies, a uh, new generation of science fiction writers, such as our friend Arthur again, with this book, The Sands of Mars, from 1951, in which uh, uh, rockets and developments of rockets are used to journey to uh, a 1950s Mars, which is charming in itself. No more canals, but we still believe there was life there. Leathery, cactus-like things, and you could walk around with stuff just a face mask on, you know. It's rather like uh, a, a mountain uh, region in, in the Earth. Um, I won't um, read much of this, but there's a, a nice little passage where um, we're on the way to Mars, and two characters are arguing about science fiction, whether science fiction is any use, has it had its day? Um, so Gibson's face creased into a smile and began to laugh. Well, show the joke. What's so funny? Our earlier conversation. I was just wondering what H.G. Wells would have thought if he'd known that one day a couple of men would be discussing his stories halfway between Earth and Mars. Don't exaggerate, said Norden. We're only a third of the way so far. <laughs> um, it's not just in the nuts and bolts of space travel, though, that um, science fiction, I believe, has had an import into this uh, ping pong match between imagination and reality. I mean, after all, beyond the, uh, uh, the, the, the technology that will take us to the planets lies our whole future, our whole future in space, maybe not in space, our future alone in the universe, maybe not alone. If we're not alone, what will our play, what, what, how will our evolution be affected by um, being part of a community of, of other intelligences? These great questions. And um, the, the ideas set out in both Wells' and Laswitz's books continue to influence us today. Now, here's my next specimen. Carl Sagan's Contact, famously made into a movie in the 90s. So he, the, Sagan was a scientist, of course, and this was one of his uh, exercises in public communication. This is very much a descendant of the kind of fiction, the kind of ideas which informed last fits, that the aliens will be benevolent. They'll be on our side. If they come here at all, they'll come to help us. Sagan's logic was, was that they had to be benevolent because anybody malevolent would have destroyed themselves long before they got off the planet, their own planet. And so I, I'm sure you know the basic story here. We receive a message from, from Vega, which turns out to be a, an instruction machine for building a wormhole, which takes us to an encounter with the aliens, where we find uh, that they're basically good guys. The, according to Sagan, the very existence of the message itself uh, will make us happy to know that there's somebody else out there. Uh, he says, for decades, young people have tried not to think too carefully about tomorrow. Now there might be a benign future after all. And as for the aliens, well, they're, they're part of a, a, a kind of galactic club who are cooperating to manage the evolution of the cosmos as a whole. It's a terrific vision, really. Uh, they've cultivated the whole galaxy. And now they've come to help us. Sagan says, we thought you could use a little help. However, at the other end of the spectrum, the Wellsian end, if I can show you one of my own uh, works here, if I may. Um, it's the cover of Exultant, one, uh, one of my novels, in which war is endemic in the galaxy. Um, as, as, as I said, this is certainly one strand of Wells' is thinking that um, natural selection, if that's universal, may require, may require war, in a sense, even between communicating intelligences. And here I've, I've imagined a future like that, where after a half a million years of war, it's affected our very evolution. And we've become child soldiers, like this girl in the, in the cover. Uh, although she's happy being a child soldier. <laughs> the, these two possibilities, you can see that these, these, are, these are conflicting ideas and theories about uh, 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 the nature of the alien and our future in the universe. Benevolent and peaceful cooperative versus malevolent and warlike. And these ideas are still extremely influential today. Now, in the last year or so, I've become involved in um, uh, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the um, radio astronomers, and I'm on an advisory committee uh, to do with all that. My committee is to do with post-detection policies. What happens if we actually detect a signal? How should we handle it? And I, I, and I became aware that I'd walked into an argument there between these two camps. Um, there, are, there are some who believe that we should signal to the aliens, not just sit and wait. Maybe they're waiting for us to signal, to show that we're ready, you know, to, to uh, 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 accept a signal from outside. Others believe that that's extremely dangerous. Maybe the, the galaxy is so quiet uh, because no one wants to attract the bad guys. We're like, we'd be like baby birds cheeping in the jungle. So it's an interesting debate about, not just about the sort of the, the, the theoretical dangers, but also about consent and choice. Who speaks for mankind? <clears throat> 
but its origins go right back to at least a century into, in, into these conflicting views of, of, uh, of, the, of the future of life in the galaxy. Um, one more example, after a century, we are, science fiction um, is capable of reflection as well. After all, we've been to the moon and then we stopped. And I'll, quote, I'll give you one more example, another of my novels here, Voyage. Uh, there's a strand of science fiction which looks backwards in a way, in a nostalgic way. In this, I hope you can see that, that here's Mars and here's a, a, a spacecraft that looks like it's been cobbled together from bits of Apollo technology, bits of the Saturn launcher and there's an Apollo um, command module sort of thing stuck on the side. Here, it's an alternate history in which NASA makes, well, the, the administration makes a different choice after Apollo and they go on to Mars, uh, as was NASA's plan after all in 1969 or 70. Um, and they reached Mars in 1986. I, I, how would it have been? This is a, a very popular book with people of about my age, you know, 40s and 50s, who grew up with the promise of Apollo, which felt as if it was never quite fulfilled. This is how it might have been. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, it's not a, a, a monochromatic view, though, because there would have been losses, in particular science compromises, as the Lunar Science Program was compromised to support Apollo. Um, but it could, I think it illustrates that as we look forward, uh, we don't necessarily have to go on. It may not be us, our civilization, that takes the next step, whatever the next step is. There's the famous example of the Chinese who, in, in the 15th century, were far ahead of the West in terms of ship technology uh, and went exploring tentatively around India and so on. But then for cultural reasons, they gave up and destroyed the treasure ships and stayed home. It may not be us, in the end, who, will, who, who, who wins out. And I'll finish with one more quote from Wells. Uh, I sometimes think reading Wells, you know, that he... Science fiction could have stopped with Wells and much of the good stuff would still have been around. Um, but here's the ending of, of, of The War of the Worlds. Um, it's not a, a detail that does not, that's not well remembered about War of the Worlds is that the Martians are seen to launch again from Mars, but they go to Venus this time and not, not to the Earth. Uh, but here's the close of War of the Worlds. Um, the broadening of men's views that have resulted can scarcely be exaggerated. Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further. If the Martians can reach Venus, there's no reason to suppose that the thing is impossible for men. And when the slow cooling of the sun makes this Earth uninhabitable, as, as at last it must do, it may be that the thread of life that has begun here will have streamed out and caught our sister planet within its toils, should we conquer. Dim and wonderful is the vision I have conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seedbed of the solar system throughout the inanimate vastness of sidereal space. But that is a remote dream. It may be, on the other hand, that the, de the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve. To them, and not to us, perhaps, is the future ordained. Thank you. definitely are open for questions if, uh, I guess, if people would like to approach a microphone. Please do come up to, uh, or she'll bring one around to you. That's very nice, Stephen. I'm Lewis Friedman from the Planetary Society. We succeeded this uh, past year in uh, taking the first book to another world, and the stories of Mars are all now on Mars in the visions of Mars. Uh, DVD that uh, we uh, developed with NASA and on the uh, on the Phoenix lander. So uh, there's the first book is on Mars, and when the astronauts get up there and need something to do, they'll be able to read all the stories that you just cited, or at least the ones about Mars that uh, inspired another generation and get the ping pong game going again. That's terrific. Are there other questions? Hi, I was just, um, I, was, I was interested to know whether you, your thoughts on, um, well, I've, I seem to realise there seems to be a trend in science fiction away from the actual hard science. There seems to be more books about sort of new age philosophies and kind of sword and sorcery and magic. And I, I'm just wondering whether there's a, a worrying trend away from the, the actual science and science fiction itself. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's a kind of a monotonic trend, you know, the, this debate between fantasy, which is more like mythology, versus the kind of SF I write, which, hard SF, which is more science-based, you know. That's another ping-pong game. That, but, uh, and I think, uh, especially with the Lord of the Rings movies and so forth, fantasy was in, was in the ascendancy for a while. But 
and commercially, science fiction is coming back. So if you're a young writer now, the thing to go into, if, 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 from my point of view, um, if your ambition is, is, uh, is science fiction. And certainly, I mean, the ping pong game I talked about has gone on with Mars, you know. You have the terrific books in the 90s by Kim Stanley Robinson on the terraforming of Mars, and a new generation of books in uh, uh, post uh, the Mars meteorite, you know, which looked as if it carried traces of life materials from Mars. Um, to do with bacterial Mars, you know, maybe we'll find a kind of bacterial uh, ecosphere there, uh, deep under the ground, and so and uh, uh, and so it goes on. Now I think this uh, SF is, is, is a there may be a maximum reach to its appeal, but it's but it seems to have a sort of underlying substrate below it which it, 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 it never sinks. So right? I'm confident about the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, Johan Jeström from Hydro Aluminium. I have two questions. Uh, during your career as a sci-fi writer, how many space conferences like this one have you visited? And my second question, would you advise uh, future science fiction writer to visit uh, the ISC or the ISC to invite them to get maybe a better view of the real science? Actually, this is the first ISC I've been to, but I've, in the course of my research, <clears throat> I've been attending SETI conferences this year, uh, writing Voyage, which was all about NASA's <laughs> history, really. Um, I researched it in London, but then went over to NASA. I took a manuscript over to NASA, and the Solar System Exploration Division especially were very helpful, the historians there. I took at some history which, which they'd lost in terms of possibilities. And I, I, I think there's, uh, there's no, for the, for the writer, there's no um, uh, uh, substitute for direct exposure to these places. I met a couple of the astronauts as well, Charles Duke, for instance, and there's no, there's no substitute for meeting these people and trying to get some sense of their experience. Um, but I think certainly, I mean, this is the theme from imagination to reality. I think, I certainly think that uh, SF writers should be invited along to, to events like this, which is why I'm involved with SETI. SF writers have traditionally been involved, maybe only one or two of us at a time, <laughs> to sessions like that, just to, just, uh, uh, science fiction has always been a kind of database of ideas ranging from the plausible all the way to the fantastic. With, with a kind of fuzzily defined margin of plausibility in between. So I, I think it's definitely a sort of like a database to tap in from, from that side, yes. Um. Hello, I'm Bob Shaw. I'd like to ask Stephen, as an established hard science fiction writer, an SF writer who's won all the awards there are, how do you feel about being introduced as a sci-fi author? Oh. <laughs> well, sci-fi uh, sci is a kind of... Um, <clears throat> It's usually taken to mean Star Trek and stuff. But what the hey, I like Star Trek as well. It's fine. I'm cool. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, sir. My, my name is Eric Patterson. I'm from Canada, <coughs> originally from Glasgow. You left out the um, role of uh, science fiction in cinema. Uh, the thing that inspired me um, the film that inspired me to become interested in space was Destination Moon, which of course was the first truly scientific, factually based uh, film of, all, of them all. And for an, a generation of people of my advancing age group, it was incredibly inspiring. I don't think any science fiction collection uh, is uh, complete without a copy of that film. Yes, I enjoyed that movie, and, and, and movies like When Worlds Collide uh, made a difference to me. It's, it's kind of relates back to the previous question. There was definitely a, you know, a, a place for, as, as a, uh, for, uh, um, uh, uh, for sci-fi, for the media stuff. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a prose writer. That's what, I'm, that, that's what really moves me. We'll do one more question now. As you can see, there's many seats up here. Stephen is going to join us here in a moment, and then the rest of the presenters today will be here, available at the end of the whole presentation for even more questions. Um, hello, my name is Jenny Edwards. I was just wondering if you believe that there's life out there, and if so, why? Oh, well, good, very good question. I wrote a whole series of novels, called the Manifold series, about that very question, where, you know, it's looking, the same people in the same situation, looking at different possibilities. One is that we're alone, one is that the hiding, one is that the universe is a dangerous place so nobody can get very far and, and, and so on. Uh, I, think my, I think my personal belief is that, that, that sh surely we're not alone. And the universe is so vast, it seems, uh, even no matter how improbable it is that intelligence evolves, it seems impossible that it should only have evolved once. 
but it's interesting that as SETI, the search for um, e ETI goes on and on and it increases its range and we still find nothing. Maybe it's further away or more distant or more strange than, than we imagine, but I don't, I don't believe we're alone, no. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. The next part of the presentations today will be on medical issues with private space travel, and we have a panel of three and a master of ceremonies that will be uh, coming up. So we'll introduce the panelists and then introduce the MC. Uh, the first panelist is Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides. She's traveled two miles down to the bottom of the ocean with director James Cameron to film the 3D IMAX movie Aliens of the Deep and trains people to float weightless on the Zero Gravity Corporation 727 aircraft. She and her husband, George, are planning to be the first ever space honeymoon on Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two. Loretta was staff for the NASA Academy program at NASA Ames Research Center and is the director of the US operations for the Space Generation Advisory Council. And she attended the International Space University Summer Session Program in Chile. Loretta is the co-founder and executive director of Yuri's Night, the annual worldwide space party held every April 12th, which she created with her husband, George, in 2001. This year, 198 events were celebrated in, only, in over 50 countries, and the participants uh, had over 8,000 trees planted to let the world know that space explorers love Earth, too. You can read her blogs about space exploration for Wired Science and see her lead workshops on launching your career in space for undergraduate students. Um, she joins now. Loretta has joined us. Yes. George Whitesides is the executive director of the National Space Society, the largest space advocacy group dedicated to human spaceflight. George serves as senior advisor to Virgin Galactic, which was founded by Sir Richard Branson as a new space venture established to undertake the challenge of making private space travel available to everyone. George also serves as the chairman of the Reusable Launch Vehicle Working Group within FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. Prior to these positions, Mr. Whitesides was the founder and director of Permission to Dream, a global space education program concerned with connecting underprivileged children with space and astronomy. George was vice president of marketing for Zero Gravity Corporation, the first commercial parabolic flight company. Mr. Whitesides received an undergraduate degree from Princeton University in 1996, and he was a Fulbright Scholar, and he received a master's degree in remote sensing and geographic information systems from the University of Cambridge in England in 2000. Whitesides is a private pilot and parabolic flight coach for Zero Gravity Corporation. Welcome, George. Our next panelist is Dr. Melkor Antuyano. He was born in Mexico City and is a graduate of the National Autonomous University of Mexico School of Medicine. He is the director of the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration Civil Aerospace Medical Institute and is responsible for the administration of national programs in aerospace medical certification, medical education, medical research, human factors research, and ocu occupational health services. He is credited with over 476 presentations and lectures at national and international conferences in aerospace medicine in 27 countries. He has received 64 awards and recognitions for his academic, administrative, and research achievements. He is a fellow and past president of the U.S. Aerospace Medical Association and past president of the Space Medicine Association. Dr. Melkor is a member of several organizations, including the International Academy of Aviation and Space Medicine, the International Academy of Astronautics, as well as a member of National Space Medicine Societies in Greece, Brazil, Mexico, Slovenia, Turkey, and Colombia. Please welcome Dr. Melkor. And our moderator for this segment is Dr. John Rummel. John was the senior scientist for astrobiology at NASA headquarters. He was the planetary protection officer and has worked on every NASA robotic planetary mission currently in operation. He is now the director of the Institute for Coastal Science and Policy at East Carolina University in the United States, and he is the chair of the Life Sciences Symposium for the IAF and the past chair of Commission Two of the International Astronautical Academy. John. 
Well, it's great to have the uh, audience uh, so enthusiastic about this subject. I wonder, after Stephen Backer's presentation, that we are actually all desiring to be extraterrestrials. It seems to me we might be a very dangerous group if we get out there. But today we'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, emerging field of commercial spaceflight, uh, the medical issues associated with having, uh, uh, you know, everybody, uh, every man go up, as it were, and uh, some of the reasons, the personal aspects, why somebody might want to go on a commercial space flight, and what it might mean to them to do that. Uh, George will uh, not talk about medicine, but we'll talk about uh, the opportunities, not only with Virgin Galactic, uh, but anything else you'd like to say about the competitors. That's probably low. But the, uh, and then Melchor uh, Antunonio will uh, talk about the uh, recent International Academy of Astronautics study on medical requirements for commercial orbital space flight, uh, somewhat in kind of position to uh, the non-orbital space flights that are being uh, begun uh, at the lower rates than the uh, buying yourself a seat on Soyuz or something along that line. And then Loretta will talk about her personal desire to go to space. And you can make uh, a judgment for yourself as George gives his presentation why she might want to be uh, on a honeymoon in space with him. Thanks very much. Um, well, it's great. It's a wonderful opportunity to be on stage with my wife, which I don't get very often. So it's uh, wonderful, wonderful to be here with you. Why don't I start off with a question that I often ask is, uh, to, to audiences, which I think might be slightly skewed in this, in this, uh, this, this group, which is, um, first of all, how many of you have been to space? If you could raise your hand, um, if you've been to space, uh, maybe, maybe if you could stand up and, and just so that we know where you are. If you've been to space, that's at least one. We got another one there. Anybody else in the audience? I think uh, might have one more. Okay, great. Well, one, maybe one in the back. I think I saw. Yes, great. Okay, big, big round of applause for our space travelers here. Okay, and my, my next question is, how many of you believe that you will be able to go to space during your, your lifetime? Um, you can either raise your hand or stand up. I get a, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good here. And, and how many of you would, would like to go, whether or not you believe that you would like, uh, whether you are able to go? And that's pretty darn good. Again, slightly biased uh, group skewing in this, in this audience. But uh, I want to talk to you about personal space flight and the opportunities that I think that we'll all have during our, during our lifetimes. And in particular, my thesis to you would be that within 15 to 20 years, most of the people that raise their hands as uh, wanting to go to space will have the opportunity to go to space. And I think that that will sort of fundamentally transform our relationship with space and, and transform humanity's relationship with space. And to do that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what's been going on for the last 15 or so years, and then I'm going to look forward for the next 15 or 20 years uh, in, in terms of what's coming down the pike, in terms of the, the very real opportunities and very exciting opportunities that are uh, being constructed now uh, in the private sector primarily. So. But to start off, I thought we'd just see some beautiful pictures on this massive screen that we've got here. This is what it's all about, right? <laughs> space, the beauty of space, the wonder of our solar system and our galaxy, and of course, the wonder of planet Earth, that sort of jewel that we happen to be so lucky to live on, and uh, thanks to JAXA, of course, for that image, and coming down to orbit and to the surface of our planet. We are so lucky to be born at a moment where we may actually be able to leave the surface of our planet and travel into space. And I think it's just, I, I always, I think it's, you know, uh, it's a wonderful sort of fortuitous uh, occurrence that, that we're born between the time that humans couldn't go to space and the time that, that many people can go to space. And that's what's really exciting. Um, and personal space flight will take us there. So let's sort of go on a little story for the last 10 years or so and then we'll go forward. There's been a tremendous amount of activity over the last uh, 15 years or so in, in the area of commercial entrepreneurial space flight. And my comments today will focus primarily on uh, private ventures that are focused on sending humans, uh, not professional astronauts, but sort of the public and, and uh, members of, 
of the interested public to go into space. And I'm going to be focusing on companies that have flown hardware, but also speak of some of the other great, great entities that are out there. The story, I think, in many ways begins in 1996, when a guy named Peter Diamandis, one of the wonderful members of our global space community, founded something called the XPRIZE, which was a competition to send a reusable spacecraft twice into space in a short period of time, about two weeks. The craft had to hold three people, and the intent was to jumpstart a race to space, a new age of space in which reusable spacecraft could take people up into the edge of space, give them the space experience, and that that in turn would generate technical innovations which could drive later space flight. A critical other development at around this time was that the International Space Station became sort of open for visits. And we had Dennis Tito, an American financier, buy the first ticket uh, with his own money to go into space. And since then, we've had four other people, all entrepreneurs in various ways, go into space. And we have our next one uh, very, very shortly. Over the next week, Richard Garrett will go into space and become, I think, the first touristic father, uh, son of a astronaut. I believe that there's a Russian uh, father-son combination that went up earlier this year. But these people, though it was a very expensive price point, showed that private space travel was not just possible, but that there was a market there. And this is really the critical point for the future of humanity and for the future of spaceflight. We need a market driver beyond the markets and the, and the processes, the budget processes that drive space today. Something outside of the government, something outside of commercial satellite technology, something that would take uh, you and me into space and, and, and prove that there was a real market for that. Now, Anusha Ansari, who many of you know, one of, the, one of these ISS travelers, did a, did a fundamentally important thing, I, I think arguably much more important than her own personal uh, trip, was to fund the X Prize, And she, she put the money up, the $10 million up, for that competition. And then another person, Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, invested in Bert Rutan, a, a designer, an aerospace designer in, uh, in California, to build a vehicle that would compete in this competition. And so they built this, uh, Spaceship One and White Knight One, uh, which was uh, an entrance to the X Prize, and which won it in 2004. And here you see uh, Bert and, and uh, some friends here right after the, right after the uh, competition. Loretta and I were there, and it was a wonderful moment. Um, then this other guy gets into the picture, Richard Branson. And he had been looking for something to invest in in space for a few years. Virgin Galactic was actually founded in 1999, as Will Whitehorn mentioned a few days ago. And the important thing there was that there was then a um, organization that was very familiar with global branding and global marketing that could sort of set up the marketing processes to, to, to have people buy tickets. And in fact, an enormous amount of people have already signed up. Nearly 300 people have now signed up for the Virgin Galactic Service. They're going to fly on this. This is what Loretta and I hope to fly on in a few years. And the first stage of that, if you will, the White Knight II carrier vehicle uh, was unveiled a few months ago out in California. And so that's sort of a, an initial tale. But what I want to quickly go through is a few more stories of some other companies that are doing great things as well. And one of them, here are some shots of uh, folks floating around and what it will be like in, in suborbital space. One of them is Elon Musk, who's founded a company called SpaceX. Many of you know that earlier this week, Elon had a success, and SpaceX had a success putting, a, putting their first rocket into orbit. And that's important not just for the fact that he's building a, an affordable, low-cost orbital access option, but because his aspiration is to build a human capsule that would go to the International Space Station and potentially other destinations. He's trying to build something that could take you and I into orbit, and that's very, very exciting. There's another company called Orbital Sciences, which is doing a similar thing, although they haven't uh, asked to uh, or haven't competed yet to, to send humans into space. Now, there's this guy, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, who's also building something. 
This is the Goddard vehicle, which he's building down in West Texas. He's, uh, he's bought himself a huge ranch, a test ranch. He's a, uh, using the proceeds from Amazon to fund this project. And it's also tremendously exciting. It's a different design. It's based sort of around the ideas of the DCX, which many of you are familiar with and which had some very successful tests in the 1990s. Um, this will be at least to start a suborbital vehicle, although many people think that uh, Jeff would also like to go uh, into <laughs> orbit eventually. A third very exciting strand here is Bigelow Aerospace. Um, Robert Bigelow is the man on the left here, and he uh, runs something called the Budget Suites of America. And uh, if you go to Las Vegas, there's a good chance that you might stay at one of his hotels. And he's very excited in a, in a different idea, which is to build a private uh, space station in orbit. And he's got various designs. And like many of these other wonderful people, he's got the money to do it. And he's actually had sec success flying real space hardware. These are uh, two of his vehicles that are now in orbit, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. They're inflatable vehicles. He's using technology that was developed by NASA as part of the TransHab program. And he's doing sort of innovative things like broadcasting the images of people on the side of his ship. And you'll see the word Blair there. That's his granddaughter's name. And so he's looking into ways to really get the public involved in the future of space. There's also great companies like Excalibur Almaz, who's uh, utilizing some, some Russian technology, and Xcore, which is doing uh, really exciting engine work on, on uh, reusable, restartable engines. This is their Thunderhawk vehicle, and they have another vehicle. There's a company called Armadillo Aerospace, and I really have to show you um, some of these images. I'm sure some, many of you know that they're competing in the Lunar Lander Challenge. But what I love is that they've got these just amazing concepts to send people into space. And you're going to love this here. This is, uh, this is uh, getting ready for launch. And then you launch. And then there you are floating. Now, I don't have the fourth chart here, which is how you get back down. But I'm sure that will be very exciting as well. And there's also, I see uh, uh, some friends out here. There's also great companies, uh, Rocket Plane, Kistler, and, and others that are doing fantastic things. But here are the people. Here are the, the uh, people who are involved. Uh, Virgin's got 300, nearly 300 folks signed up with, uh, I think, around 40 million in deposits. And that's very exciting. That's real people. They're not, they're not uh, people who are necessarily worth billions of dollars, but they're, they're making, making it go because their dream is to go into space. And uh, without them, it really wouldn't be possible. Um, now, I, th th we're starting to go through the, the reality of this program, which is really great. We're, we're uh, doing centrifuge testing. This is Loretta in uh, looking actually fairly good, I think, at uh, six Gs here, and uh, far better than I was. And, and, uh, and, and recently, there was uh, about a, uh, 80 people went through a 6G test flight program, as a test program. Uh, and, and here's one of my favorite pictures of all time, which is, of course, Stephen Hawking floating in, in weightlessness recently on board the zero gravity parabolic flight vehicle. Now, that's not necessarily going to space, but it's certainly a precursor space activity, and it's something that has a much lower price point. I, you know, I, 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 when I was at Cambridge, I would see um, Dr. Hawking fairly often, and, and I don't think I ever saw him smile this much as he did uh, when, he was, when he was floating there. And it's just such a wonderful moment to see, to see the freedom and the, and the joy and the interest in that. So just a final couple words, um, don't have much time here, but uh, of, of the future. And I really think that what's really going to blow this all open is point-to-point -point space travel. You're going from Glasgow to Los Angeles in two hours, or, or wherever. Um, uh, you know, I think that that's going to be a tremendously exciting thing. It's going to be bigger than tourism. Uh, who wouldn't want to go on long-distance journeys uh, faster? And I think as long as it's safe, uh, it will. There are space sports springing up all over the United States. Here's one of them. This is the Virgin Galactic spaceport that's being built by the New Mexico uh, Spaceport Authority. We'll be the anchor tenant of that down in New Mexico. I think it's sort of a science fiction shape. And, uh, and then the future entails all kinds of human activity. I think every kind of human activity gets better when the word space is attached to it. Um, you know, you have space sports. And uh, Loretta and I have talked about being space uh, garbage collectors, you know. And, and we'll eventually have lunar uh, tourism. You know, uh, Space Adventures has announced this concept of using a couple of Soyuz to, to make the journey. Apparently, it's well suited to that. I think that that'll come, $100 million. I don't have it, but someone does. And it would certainly make history. 
And down the road, of course, we'll be cavorting on asteroids and uh, perhaps saving the planet. But so that's, that's just sort of an overview. It's a tremendously exciting time. I, I'm not sure that um, the world really realizes the tremendous amount of activity that's going on in entrepreneurial space flight. But it's coming and it's going to change. Uh, it's going to change everything. Thanks so much. Well, the expectation is that uh, this will uh, open up a frontier. We can take one question uh, while Mel gets up to the podium. If uh, somebody's got a burning question right now, uh, please go ahead and step up and, or raise your hand and the mic will happen. But we'll also try to have uh, time for questions at the end of the session for everyone as well. Is there any uh, particular question right now? Okay. I think it looks good um, if we get our bodies into uh, orbit. However, we need to know what's going to happen to them and uh, what the uh, current considerations are from the International Academy of Astronautics. Mel, take it away. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation to participate in this panel. Uh, even though I'm an aerospace medicine specialist, considering that most of the attendees are not physicians, I'm not going to bore you with lists of medical conditions that are of concern. But I want to share with you some of the considerations as to why we put together this uh, study group, what were some of the issues, safety-related, medical-related, and why uh, finally we have a report that was approved this week so it's going to be finally released uh, to the public and it's going to be made available through the IAA website. Where is the... Oh, here we are. So I like this quote from uh, Einstein. He said, I never think of the future because it comes, it comes soon enough. And in a way, that's the way we are, or that's where we are in commercial space operations because some of us were surprised how fast things were developing and in some regards, that we were a little bit behind the, the power curve on the medical side. So why are we doing this study? And there are a couple of things. Uh, you already saw some of the suborbital and some of the orbital space operations. We know so far we have had five people going as part of space adventures on the uh, uh, flights to the International Space Station. But from a medical perspective, there is one individual, Greg Olson, that he actually allowed the public to have access to his medical records after he completed the flight. He was an individual, who, or he's an individual who had many medical problems that before he was allowed to fly, he had to have surgery, he had to have rehabilitation, he had to do many other things in order to let him go. So it was not an issue of telling him, sorry, you are not going. Well, this is what we have to do, and then you are going. So from that perspective, it was a challenge, but people like him that were willing to disclose the findings from a medical perspective, that makes a huge difference for the rest of us because now we know what kind of flexibility we can use for letting people go to space. And this is another quote that I really like. It says, the problem is never how to get new, innovative thoughts into your mind, but how to get the old ones out. And what that means is that we have to push the envelope. We, kept, we have to keep doing innovative things. And one of those, of course, is the proposal that now we should have space tourists that should do a space walk for an additional multi-million dollar fee that may be 10, 15 million dollars more. But if people can afford it, why not? And if, you can do it sa if they can do it safely, why not? I would do it. If I had the money, I would do it. <laughs> Obviously, the other option that was proposed, the circumlunar flights for about $100 million. There are some people who can afford it. Go for it. Why not? Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because some of those were already shown. But I want to show you this one because in the uh, proposed design for the Dragon for, by SpaceX, it would accommodate up to seven passengers. And this one is not considered a suborbital. This would be considered an orbital vehicle. And Fortunately, they have had finally their uh, very successful flight last week that opens other doors to actually continue also the development of this capsule. And finally to go on lunar flights uh, with different types of proposed vehicles. So what's really the bottom line here? That we have other options. The same thing with the commercial space stations. Uh, as uh, it was mentioned that, that, that we have two modules right now in orbit. The one thing that I'm going to add to that from a medical perspective that there is a biological payload. Genesis 1 has roaches and Mexican jumping beans, and I'm glad because those are from Mexico. 
Genesis 2 has roaches, ants, and scorpions. And that was to test not only carrying a biological organism, but some rudimentary life support systems requirement. If everything goes according to plan, it is very likely that he will skip launching a larger module this year and just go for the Sundance module in 2010 and prepare it for human occupancy by 2012. So there are certain components or certain proposals that yes, there are things that are for sale in space. Now let me go back and now cover a little bit of the safety related issues. Right now around the world, only the US has established licensing requirements for manned commercial space operations. Nobody else has done it to the extent that we have done it. However, one of the very strict requirements is that the passengers have to be fully informed about all of the potential risks of participating in space flights, which begs the question, what potential risks should be disclosed? Because on the one hand, you want to decrease to some extent the liability and that's why you want to disclose all the potential risks. But on the other hand, you don't, have, you don't want to scare people that they will say, I changed my mind, I don't want to go anymore. So what's the right approach to be determined? So let me cover with you why risk dis uh, disclosure is important. And here we have the situation where an individual who goes can be a teddy bear or can be a grizzly bear. And let's face it, in societies including the United States, people like to sue. And if people like to sue, if everything goes according to plan, everything is perfect, no problem. And usually if there is a bad outcome, usually the person who is going to sue is not the person who signed the release of responsibility because that person is not coming back. So it may be somebody else, maybe the spouse, maybe a close relative. So all of those are, issue, are issues that we have to address. At the same time, we have to keep in mind that the public, all of us, we have the right to take some personal risks. We do. And I love this quote from Michelangelo. He said, the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. So we have to keep pushing the envelope. But at the same time, we have to always be prepared to deal with the risks in disguise. And that's why the full disclosure is very important. I love kayaks. And some of you may be kayakers, but what is the main risk if you're in a kayak and you don't know how to do it? That you get in the kayak, you flip upside down, you don't get out of it, and you drown. But you see this image, and you see, well, there are no waves, obviously no wind, perfect day. So the relative risk here, you would say, that's a low risk. Well, depends on the information that I give you, because if now I show you this, did that change your <laughs> risk perception? Yes. And from that perspective, you have to get more information, more disclosure of the potential risks to make a good decision. So the question is, is it risky to fly in space? Yes, it is. It is risky to fly an airplane, but the risks vary. And there are different differences. Uh, in this case, suborbital versus orbital flights, short flights <coughs> versus long flights. But do we know all of the medical risks of flying in space? Do we know them all? The answer is no. We have very limited experience, mostly with young professional astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts, but we don't have experience with people who have medical problems who, that we give them waivers and we allow them to fly in space. What medical data is available to the public? There is limited, but based on professional astronauts, we have this report that includes 106 space shuttle missions, that many astronauts, that many flights. And you can see that 98% of men and 94% of women reported that many in-flight medical events, most of them minor. But the issue is that even very healthy people will experience certain symptoms and signs in space. There is another report that we don't have the time to talk about, which uh, that covers cosmonauts in the MIR program from those years. And then also in the NASA MIR program from that time period. Anybody interested, I can give you the references. But what about the experience that we have had in commercial spaceflight participants? And as I mentioned, Gregory Olson, not, not bothering you with details, but he had all kinds of medical problems. He underwent preventive treatment, including preventive surgery, in order to make it possible for him to fly. At the same time, he had to be tested 
altitude chamber, altitude gas mixture simulation, a zero G flight, and the centrifuge to make sure that whatever was done medically was correct so he could be allowed to fly. He flew, came back, no problem, he did it. But that brings the question, then what's the right stuff for passengers in commercial space flights? Is it just to fit certain <laughs> physical criteria and that's it? No, we have to go beyond that. How far? Flexibility is, is the, the matter here. So that's why we put together this working group. Here are all the people participating from many countries around the world. And the objective became to identify and prioritize the medical screening considerations to do two things. Preserve the health and promote the safety of the pay, paying passengers in orbital flights up to four weeks in duration. The final product is a report that, as I indicated, has been approved this week in this meeting, so it will be released to the public. But there is one, one requirement, that the way we decide, de uh, develop the guidelines, there is a requirement that passengers will be able and capable of performing an emergency evacuation without assistance and not compromising other people in the flight. Now, this is not a theory. We know that in the experimental flights of the Spaceship One, there was one hard landing. So we have already tested that there is a potential here for an evacuation. And I will show you a couple of things. This is a hard landing in an airplane. Look at the tail. OK? So we're not talking about theoretical things. We are talking about things that can happen. This is an impact 16 times the force of gravity with nine G seats that are commonly used in aircraft. So hopefully, we will go with higher G tolerance seats for commercial space vehicles. Then we have the issue of evacuation. And there are some <laughs> challenges here as well. That people, unless they practice, they don't know how to get out of an airplane. Well, we'll have to make sure that people going in a space vehicle, they practice to get out of a space vehicle. And if it is a real emergency, trust me, people are not going to be nice. <laughs> people will try to get out at the same time. So practice, practice, training is very important, OK? And this was an experiment. And see how serious people were. How did we get to this point? We told people. If you are among the ten, top 10% 10 getting out first, we double your pay. And that, that was the incentive to do this, OK? And this, uh, now we did it in a worst case scenario with smoke. Because that's why you want to get out of a vehicle right away. Because once you crash, if you survive the crash, the next thing that is likely to get you is the smoke. If the smoke doesn't get you, then the fire. And this is a 90 second time interval between the beginning of a fire and the end of a fire. So once you crash, you survive, get out immediately. We have had precedent in the space program, so this is not theoretical. And now let's say that you survived the initial impact. You survived, you didn't inhale smoke. You survived the fire. Now you get out to the environment. Now you have to watch out because it can be a nasty environment. And now you have to deal with survival scenarios, which we have had several. I will only share this one with you. Uh, Bosca 2 Sunrise in 1965, they have different failures. But finally, they had a, a problem with separation of the service module. The vehicle was tumbling, crash landed 1,200 miles off target, and they spent the night surrounded by wolves. So obviously, that's another concern that we didn't think about. Any pre-existing medical condition could be made worse by being exposed to the stresses of space flight. So that's what we are going to be looking for, what can happen to people. And we do it in connection with these, these uh, particular factors. Acceleration, pressure, microgravity, solar radiation, all of these factors were what determined the list of medical conditions that we are saying we have to watch for, OK? So I'm not going to go into the specific medical conditions. But just to share with you some of the issues about acceleration. I'm here just to make a point, Saturn V, what was the maximum G load with the Saturn V? Close to 8 Gs. What's the maximum G load on the space shuttle? Anybody? Three. Maximum three. You can go on a roller coaster in Cedar Point in Ohio at 3.5. So you can be in a roller coaster right faster than the space shuttle. But now we go to vehicles like the sp Spaceship One. You heard in the previous presentation, there could be up to 5.8 Gs. 
So obviously, say, there are some issues related to acceleration exposure. Issues about barometric pressure, we have had, unfortunately, also incidents in the past. In, f in fact, in this particular case, it was a fatal accident, that there was a failure of a valve that depressurized the, the spacecraft, and all of the occupants died 30 minutes before landing be because of depressurization. We had, of course, this in-flight collision between a Progress M34 that uh, crashed against the Spectre module that depressurized, but fortunately they were able to close one of the hatches so that that way you did not decompress the entire station. But let's think about this. For orbital flights, you have to worry about space debris. And space debris, it doesn't matter how big or how small, it matters also the speed. The space shuttle program has replaced 80 windows as a result of space debris. This is the damage caused by a speck of paint traveling at a very high speed and causing essentially a, one, a quarter inch crater on the surface of the window. All of these arrows on the uh, space telescope, one of the panels, point to micro craters caused by or orbiting debris. And this is a study that was released in February 2007 by NASA, where it says that a, there is an 18% chance that debris will e impact wood force abandoning the International Space Station when it is complete. A 9% chance of penetration that would lead to loss of station or its crew. So obviously we have to think about that. Now also on EVA activities, if we start doing private EVAs, well, we have to th think about those things. Microgravity, I will not bother you with the details, but the mo four most critical systems that we have to worry about, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, neurovestibular, and your blood, essentially, and your uh, immune defenses, your immunological system. Uh, osteoporosis, we have here an issue, a normal bone on Earth, a bone with osteoporosis on Earth but we are seeing the same changes in space. But look at this, it is reported that 3.2% of bus loss occurs after 10 days of exposure to microgravity. So obviously somebody who has already lost bone is likely to lose more. Then we have issues about exposure to ionizing radiation, both solar and galactic cosmic radiation. We have issues about high intensity noise, non-ionizing radiation, vibration. This is a launch uh, video of a launch of a space shuttle Look how the vibration impacts the entire body. So there are certain medical conditions that obviously would not be okay if you are going to expose those individuals to vibration, okay? Temperature, we have other issues with temperature, extremes, very high temperature, very low temperature. Then we have issues with cabin air quality. One of, one of the factors in the uh, Apollo 13 was that CO2 was building up, so it became a cabin air issue that they had to put together uh, some equipment in flight to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Odors, we haven't talked about that. There may be biological chemical substances, but just the smell. When we have the astronauts on the next part of the panel, ask them about how good it smells when they have been in the space station, in previous space stations, and they will tell you some things. Issues about behavioral issues, we have to think about that, crew composition, but even in four week space flights, there can be interesting relationships or interesting behaviors among certain people. So we have also to keep in mind that for these commercial orbital space flights, there will be limited medical intervention capabilities. Then obviously this report will have to complete a physical exam they will have certain medical tests. Certain medical conditions may not be qualified at all, even if we try our best to uh, prepare them. Then the disposition of those, well, under what conditions we can give waivers, under what conditions we cannot. Now, a big difference is that this, this approach is extremely flexible. There are some issues about pre-flight exposure in the middle of the flight and then post-flight issues. And in, we included in the report a section at the end from the space law section that has to do with medical liability issues in ap uh, applying some of the existing international treaties. So we're mixing now medical law with space law and that's included in this report. So with that, I wanted to finish my presentation with this. I always want to go to space and even if I can do it, cannot do it while I'm alive because it is very expensive right now. There is this company that if you want your ashes just to go in a parabolic flight, it's called close to $700 for one gram. Earth orbit, $2,500.
Around the moon, they have proposed for $9,000, one gram, or beyond the solar system, $12,000. So one way or another, I'm going to go to space. Thank you very much. <laughs> We can always be happy to look forward to those times when the greatest danger for commercial spaceflight are our fellow passengers. And, uh, but we have some medical concerns now. We're going to uh, skip the opportunity for free medical advice until the end of Loretta's uh, presentation. And Loretta, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, John. Oh, so after hearing all the reasons why you might not want to go into space, I get to tell you a little bit about why I do want to. So I usually give really like more technical talks, so it's sort of interesting to have to talk from the heart. Um, I wanted to go into space ever since I was a little girl. And when I was a child, you know, adults would come up and ask me, oh, well, do you want to be an astronaut when you grow up? And I was always sort of perplexed because I would say, no, when I grow up, you won't need to be an astronaut to go into space. We're all just going to have rockets in our garages. Now, I don't have a rocket in my garage, but I do have a space ticket in my hand. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Um, and so people ask me why, why, would, why I would do that, why I would want to go into space. Why has space been so important to me my whole life? Why has it rocked me to my core? I think George said it really well. It's the transformative effect that space can have on people. That's what moves me. That's what I care about. In college, I read a book called The Overview Effect by Frank White. And in it, he interviews astronauts and cosmonauts about their experience of being on orbit. And overwhelmingly, they talk about looking back at the Earth and seeing that fragile blue planet and that thin layer of atmosphere protecting it. And they talk about how they just fall in love with our home planet for the, you know, more than they ever knew they could. And they talk about looking down on the Earth and not seeing the boundaries of the countries. You know, just seeing one planet, one people. That's who we are. And they actually get a taste of that. They actually get a glimpse of that while they're there. And for some of them, the experience is so profound and so powerful that they have a hard time when they get back to Earth. You know, the things, the petty things that used to bother them before they launched just seem insignificant now. My husband George likes to say that any problem you have on Earth looks pretty small from 330,000 feet. You know, sometimes I think of it a little bit like the first time you go abroad, you know, and you, you're out experiencing the world and you come back to your hometown and you come back to your own the house you grew up in and suddenly it looks more beautiful than you ever remember. <coughs> now, some of the astronauts that I've talked to have trouble describing in words like what the experience was like and many of them have turned to music and to painting to express or to recapture the experience, that feeling that they had while they were there. I um, interned in the astronaut office when I finished college, and I had the privilege of working with Dr. Chuck Brady um, right after he got back from his first space flight. And he was talking about how he'd struggled to uh, figure out which 10 CDs he wanted to bring with him to orbit, because he can only fit so much. And uh, he said, I don't know why I struggled so hard. In the end, the entire mission, there was only one CD that could even capture the intensity and the power and the beauty of what I was seeing. The only CD I listened to the whole time was Handel's Messiah. I also had the privilege of meeting another shuttle astronaut recently, and she was telling me a story about her love of music, and, uh, and then another story about how she was in the astronaut office one day, and she saw another astronaut who slumped over his desk, sort of sad, uh, just come back from his first mission. And she looked over, she went over to him and she nodded understandingly. And she said, it's okay, it's normal to feel sad that you've had to come, be coming home from your first mission. You know, you just had this really powerful experience. It's like we all go through it. And he looked up at her appreciatively to know that he wasn't the only one who was feeling that way, dealing with all, dealing with all that. One of the things I'm most excited about in this new era of, of commercial human space exploration is that there'll be more people, more artists, more poets, more writers, 
going out into space to share their experiences with the public, like Anusha Ansari did with her blog that captivated the world. There'll be more people to be able to share firsthand. More people in the world like, will be able to hear firsthand from people their experience, just like you will get to today. Soon my husband George and I will be among that group of people who will be able to share their experience of space firsthand. And it's the fulfillment of a lifelong dream for both of us. George also has wanted to go into space since he was young. And we're all the more excited to get to go to space together. Part of the motivation for us doing our honeymoon together in space with Virgin Galactic is to inspire other people that they can reach for their dreams too. So no matter who you are or what your field of interest is or what brought you here, what's the dream that inspires you? What's the idea that, that lights you up, that moves your heart? Set your sights on it and tell the people around you all about it and then make it happen. And then you too can go about telling, being, giving other people the courage to follow their dreams too. So we also hope that our space honeymoon will open up a discussion on peace, love, and family in space. This is one part of the human expansion in space that's not often talked about. But I think as more and more people go into space, it'll start getting more attention. And we're really excited to be a part of opening up that discussion. Another huge motivation for us is to be early adopters, people who are investing in the infancy of a new industry, helping to make it thrive and become available to more people so that eventually we'll have suborbitals, we'll have spaceports on every continent, and anybody who wants to will be able to go into space. I think the impact of suborbital space travel uh, will make things possible that we in this room can't even imagine right now, the same way that many of the things we take for granted today in our world were unimaginable at the time of the Wright brothers. And I find that the most uh, exciting. <coughs> Sometimes I joke with my friends that we'll know we got our job done when our grandkids fall asleep on launch because it's so boring. <laughs> when are we going to get there? Two hours? Oh my gosh. Um, a lot of people here at this conference have a passion for space exploration, just like we do. Sometimes it goes beyond the rational or the practical. Sometimes I think more of this more as a calling than a career. For me, it's a calling to be greater than ourselves, for us to give our lives to making something possible for the human race. Spaces already have the privilege to be able to contribute something extraordinary to humankind. We were able to contribute the most, one of the most inspiring events of the 20th century, the Apollo 11 moon landing. People still say, if we can land on the man on the moon, we can do anything. My commitment is that our industry be that for the world again, that we be that inspiring, that we be out doing the impossible, that we be out producing that result in the world. We didn't come here for anything less. Anyone in this room, or certainly the, the experts from the conference, could tell you about the vast resources of outer space that are there for uh, throughout the solar system and beyond. But to me, the most extraordinary resource of outer space is lim both limited and non-renewable, and it's space itself. It's the opportunity that space represents. For me, what I'm most passionate about space is that space is a blank slate, and on that slate we get to create whatever we want. We get to create a whole new society, a whole new civilization for humankind. We get to build on and learn everything that we've learned collectively as a human society for the last couple centuries, or well, okay, as long as we've been around, I guess. And we get to have the possibility of creating a civilization that works for everybody. To me, the, I'm excited about that opportunity that in our lifetime, we will be able to set those precedents for how we're gonna live and work in space. And to me, that's the most precious and the most important resource that is out in outer space and I want to make sure we protect it and use it responsibly. One minute. Thanks, John. So I first met my husband at Unispace 3 conference in uh, Austria in 1999 at the Space Generation Forum and I want to thank anyone in the audience who had a hand in helping plan that conference because I got to meet him there. And I was really impressed with his poise and his leadership and his vision. He shares the same vision of space that I do, using space to bring the world together. That's the reason we founded Yuri's Night. 
And it's the reason we're doing our honeymoon together in space. Because we want to show the world that space isn't just about solid rocket motors or orbital mechanics, but it's about people. It's about sharing our lives and our passion and our vision and our love. We actually call our mission Space Love. Just imagine if we had more love in our space missions, in our space industry, or even in our planet. I can't think of a better way to spend my honeymoon. So thanks for being here. Thanks for caring about space. Thanks for everything you do to make it possible. And thanks for letting me share my heart with you. I've been informed that we have time for uh, two questions for this panel uh, before we uh, re assemble the full panel. Are there any questions in the audience? I had a quick question for George. Um, if you can take it, it seems that in the development of both the commercial shipping industry and also the development of the airline industry, that passengers have basically been supercargo historically over uh, something that paid better money. Um, a lot of the uh, examples you showed were focusing on passengers alone and not much cargo. How do you think the balance will turn out in the long run? I think that's a really great point, and uh, it may well be that uh, fast uh, package delivery becomes a, a, a significant part of, of space travel, particularly as costs go down. Uh, we, don't, we don't know for sure, but the interesting thing is that um, uh, perhaps paradoxically, humans or uh, uh, self-loading carbon payloads, as, uh, as we like to call them, um, uh, can pony up before the service is actually available. And that provides sort of a catalytic impact for the market. Um, I think that if you look back at the, uh, the, the uh, mail services in the early age of aviation, obviously that was sort of the critical thing. And we may well see that services to the International Space Station providing water or other sorts of basic utilities uh, are the closest analogy maybe to that mail, mail service. Okay. Thank you. I do worry a little bit because my ancestors were asked to leave this country and uh, they had to find ships, but I'm not sure that we're in that position right yet for space. Any other questions? Okay. Yep. Our next segment today is life as an astronaut. We're lucky enough to have, I believe I've seen six astronauts in the room. Four of them will be joining us up here. From Russia, we have Sergei Kriklev. He's spent more time in space than anybody else at over 803 days and nine hours. Our second astronaut is Chiaki Mukai. She was the first woman astronaut from Japan. She was also the first Japanese citizen to fly twice. Third is Jean-Francois Clairvoy. He flew three shuttle missions, including one servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope. And our fourth astronaut is Yi so Young, the first astronaut from the country of South Korea. Astronauts, please come join us. As they take their seats, we're going to ask each of you to maybe take about a minute to two minutes to introduce yourself to us so we all know a little bit more about you. And then we're going to open up to questions for everybody who's up here on the stage right now. So, Sergey, if you'd like to start since you're on the end. And to talk about uh, missions, I'm afraid it takes too much time. <laughs> <laughs> So just briefly, I can uh, say that uh, my first flight was almost 20 years ago. Uh, we started to fly on Mir Station. It was uh, Expedition 4 uh, on Mir Station, uh, year 1988. Uh, it was very interesting flight because for me it was first flight and then uh, it was international mission. When beginning of our flight, when we switched with Expedition 3, we had uh, joined Soviet-French expedition with General Kretian. And uh, then we stayed for several months more uh, doing our job on long-duration mission. My second flight was expedition, was planned as Expedition uh, 9 mission on, uh, on Mir Station. 
and it happened to be Expedition 9 and 10 in one flight. So it was long, long duration flight, a little more than 10 months. Uh, my third flight was also very, very interesting for me because I already knew uh, Russian hardware, Russian space program very well and spent more than 15 months in space. Uh, my third flight was a uh, shuttle mission when I was assigned to, uh, to be first Russian to fly on shuttle. And my partner, Volodya Titov, and I, we spent more than a year uh, on the training for, for shuttle mission. And it was a very nice experience also. Uh, fourth flight was the first assembly mission when uh, decisions were made to build the station and I was on the crew that put two pieces, first two pieces of uh, International Space Station together. And Bob Cabana and I opened the hatch for the first time and together flowed in, into the station. Uh, it's a very interesting flight and very good memory. And actually this year we are going to celebrate 10 years of this flight. Um, Fifth flight was very interesting again because it was uh, Expedition 1, first long duration mission on ISS. And most recent flight was uh, Expedition 11 on ISS. Uh, I was still in flight about three years ago. And the next one. <laughs> uh, see, we a little bit superstition <laughs> in, in our business, so I would prefer to tell about next mission when I return back. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for inviting us. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk about our experience. I was very lucky to fly three very different missions, three different altitudes and three different uh, orbits. That's a big deal because when you have an orbit that is quite inclined above the equator plane, as you rotate on the orbit combined with the rotation of the Earth, you, you see more Earth than when you are on a on an orbit uh, close to the equator. On my, my first mission was a mission dedicated to atmospheric research. So we were flying upside down almost the whole time and we had the overhead windows uh, facing the Earth. So we, with Scott Parazinski in my shift, we were often uh, kneeing down and sitting uh, on, the, on the overhead window facing the Earth and we took uh, more than uh, one, uh, 11,000 pictures in 11 days. So you, we, we have, uh, that was the best mission for the view of the Earth. And I think that's the strongest memory for astronauts is probably the view of our planet as we go around uh, 16 times per day around the Earth. Uh, and we fly over 45 minutes in daylight, 45 minutes in nighttime, 45 minutes on a given season. And the other 45 minutes, if it's winter on the North Hemisphere, you fly above uh, summer uh, in the South Hemisphere. And I have the best memory of the view of our own planet from that first mission. My second space flight was uh, slightly uh, lower inclination, 51 degrees to Mir, so we could go a bit higher. And it's a question of uh, equal energy, so 400 kilometer altitude. And that was a very uh, memorable mission uh, on the human aspect. I mean, going to a station where you know the people are counting on you to bring food, to bring equipment, so that they can keep living and working on board is, is great. And uh, we had a superb uh, five days docked uh, together, 10 of us. Um, I even went to the cinema on board because when I came in Mir, I saw a lot of videotapes on the side and I told uh, um, Vasily, the commander of Mir, uh, we can watch a movie here. He said, yes, when you want, you tell me. And the day before undock, we were done with the mission. I mean, the exchange of four tons of equipment. And he told me, you can, uh, you can choose a movie and we, we watch a movie tonight. And uh, so we, he came to a module, came back with a TV, and he told me, you know, the, the speakers are, are broken, so we have to connect to the intercom of the station, which is not good quality for music or for, for a movie. And uh, then he went to another module and brought back an old uh, videotape recorder that probably Sergei used a lot. And then we watched a movie. It was, it was quite fun. And my third mission was a mission for science. Uh, uh, we, were, we had no other objectives than repairing, fixing the Hubble Space Telescope. It was broken. It was in survival mode. I was told before the mission, 
you, we cannot tell you which attitude you will find the telescope in because it will be just in survival facing the sun and it may be upside down. You will need to fly the robotic arm, uh, do some tracking and capture, and, and we fixed it. So that's, that's a great satisfaction for astronauts when they come back and the mission is successful. So three different missions and each time uh, very strong memories, uh, very strong sense of duty. You know, the fear number one of astronauts is not to die, it's to, to miss the objective and to make a failure or to, to miss something and not come back with 100% success because we know there are thousands of people behind us waiting for, looking at us and waiting for, uh, for a return with um, all objectives uh, met. So uh, now as far as uh, life on board, the work on board, we can talk later about this. Thanks. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm so afraid to say something because if you can give me a time proportional to the flight time, and then I think about Sergey talk less than 10 minutes, so maybe I can have 10 seconds or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, last April, I have been in ISS for 10 days, and then I was some kind of representative of Korea because until that time, you don't have any astronaut. So I'm so honored to be there as a representative of Korea, and then I carried out 18 experiments. So I'm sure that I was maybe as busy as like Sergey, even though I was there just 10 days. Uh, so, so many experiments I did, but I, I was so happy to do that for so many people. And then at the time, I realized that uh, we are live on the one of a beautiful planet in the universe. And space something is really, really international because officially I was a uh, Russian crew. But every meal I ate NASA foods. And then for the downlink, uh, I did a video filming with a Sony camera, but I should use uh, uh, instrument in NASA module, but it's made by Japanese. And I used the channel of the NASA and I, ha I carried out so many experiments in ATV. It's made of a European. So it was really, really mixed. I cannot make some kind of category. It's all are mixed in this space. So I realized that we all together do something for space. And thank you. And then I think I can say some other things later. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for your invitation. My name is Chiaki Mukai from Japanese Space Agency. And I flew two times in the space shuttle program, and also I worked as a backup crew two times. And all of the missions are uh, space life science, uh, space laboratory type of mission. And my last assignment from NASA was the deputy mission scientist for STS 107, Columbia. The experiment went very well. Unfortunately, the Columbia didn't come back. So, but anyhow, I have been fascinated by utilizing the space environment, which is a microgravity environment for many experiments. And also, uh, the reason why I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to go to space, was that I really wanted to see our home planet by my naked eyes. And also, since my background is medicine, I'm very much interested in the uh, physiology and also the, uh, any kind of utilization programs, including education, etc. So my first flight was the, back in 1994, called International Microgravity, the second mission, which has around 100 uh, experiments on board quite a lot of international uh, the experiments uh, working together. And the second mission was with uh, Senator John Glenn and also the first Spanish astronaut, Pedro Duque. And the second mission was also very much interested in it because uh, we are trying to find out the differences between, a uh, difference and the similarities between the aging process and the physiology. So I think um, 
I'm still fascinated by uh, quite a lot of possibilities which gives us uh, uh, from the space environment. So that's why I'm very happy to be working for this program. Thank you. So now, for those of you in the audience, if you have any questions that you want to ask an astronaut, somebody who will soon be an astronaut, somebody who's written books about astronauts, or somebody who looks at the medical necessities to see if you can even be an astronaut, please raise your hand and our microphone will come around to you. Uh, Edmund Buckley from Scotland. Uh, can you tell me how it felt the first few minutes back on Earth? I, th I think we have four probably different viewpoints on that, so why don't each of you just take 30 seconds. And what did it feel like when you came back to Earth? First few minutes after you yeah. I felt I was lead. <laughs> <laughs> I felt I was very heavy. I was uh, sitting behind the pilot on my first uh, return, holding a camcorder to film, uh, to take a video of the entry through the front uh, windshield. And every 10 seconds, <laughs> I couldn't hold my arm. Uh, it was too, too heavy. And once I lay on my bed for the first time, that same day of landing, I had the feeling that I was making my bed like a U. I was led, but in fact, uh, I was just my weight normal. Actually, the feeling after short duration and long duration flights are different. And as you can imagine, after long duration flight, your muscles uh, get so used to weightlessness that uh, it's really, a, you, you mention this gravity all the time. You, you see that everything is falling down. You have to put efforts to move everything up. Uh, but I think, and again, it's different from flight to flight, but I remember probably first feeling after landing is a uh, feel of relief, relief of responsibility we had during our long flight. Uh, maybe all you guys know that I had a ballistic reentry. So during the during I have a high G, uh, my onboard document is too heavy. So. Just after landing, and then just after landing, and then all stops is falling on my face because I was down. So Peggy asked to me, who is up and who is down? So I said, maybe I am down because all stops in on, on my face. And then at, at the very after time, it was really surprising because just after landing, Yuri start to move and open the hatch and then get out, get out of the so it was really surprising. It, it doesn't take less than 10 minutes. And then he said to me, please try to get out of the soils. And then I said to him, I can't because all the document is too heavy. Because at the time, I couldn't realize it. I just in the 1G. I feel like 8G or 9G. So, oh, it's too heavy. And then he said to me, no kidding, it's not that heavy. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> so take off all the onboard document. And then he pulled me out. And then I'm taking off the Soyuz, and it was more ridiculous because so many people around us because they think we are alien or something. And then they stare at me, and then they stare at Yuri, and then they, but they cannot come to us because they feel a little afraid. So we can read their eyes. And then, but after we taking a rest around the Soyuz, and then they, maybe they guess we are dead. So. They come to us and then just start to touch, and then we move, and then they surprise and then get back already. So I think it was a really unique experience, and it was really fantastic. And then finally, I tried to talk them. I'm not an alien. I'm just an astronaut. <laughs> so being in space is wonderful. At the same time, coming back was also wonderful too. So after the deorbit, everything started falling down. It was fascinating to see something start falling down because we have never seen everything falling down or something like that when we were in orbit. And then after the landing, I was so excited. Of course, first of all, I, I thought, oh, safely landed. Oh, I did it. This is my day or something like that, I felt. And then after that, everything felt so heavy 
like uh, even the small size of the paper, I felt, I sensed the weight, like, oh my God, this paper actually has a weight. <laughs> and I was so excited because <laughs> thanks to the space flight, now I have a very special ability, even which even I can sense the weight of the small size of the paper. But of course, human body has a great adaptability to the new environment soon, so I lost that great uh, potential to feel the paper, uh, uh, size of uh, the paper weight. So, but uh, landing was exciting, that was, that was so uh, wonderful day. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, my name is Christopher Lowe, I'm from England. Um, like many others, I'm sure, I'd like to be sitting where you are in a few years' time. My question to all of you, again, is uh, before your first flight, if you'd have been told it was only going to be a one-way ticket, would you still have gone? If it's one-way ticket? Oh, I got it. It's easy to... If it's a one-way ticket, I would not go. I need a round of tickets. <laughs> If it's one way ticket to rejoin my family who is already based on the moon or on Mars, uh, yes, oh. I go. <laughs> but if it's, in, if it's a one way ticket to go nowhere and, uh, and die somewhere, no, I don't go. Uh, probably there are different uh, views uh, of this subject uh, from professionals and non professionals. Because I know that some enthusiasts can say, well, send me to the moon and I don't care if I return back. As professionals, we. Uh, never think this way because this is our job to make it uh, not only for us but for people who go after us and if someone will fly with a uh, one-way ticket it probably wouldn't help us to develop this this move that's right actually i'm hesitating with the two options and then first one is i'd better ask them to give me a round round ticket and then promise to them, I will work hard and then I will give it back uh, less of the money. <laughs> Maybe it's a little cheaper than two one-way ticket. And second option is I'd better go to maybe really, really attractive guy and ask him to go <laughs> there together. <laughs> and then we will not get back. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sanjay Som from Geneva, Switzerland. Um, my question is to Jean-François Clairvoy. You mentioned you were watching a movie on Mir. Could you tell us what it is and would you re recommend it? <laughs> uh, it was Outbreak with... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was dubbed in Russian, but very hard to understand through the speakers, so I could read the English uh, subtitles. <laughs> I have a question for the panel over here, as long as we're on the topic of movies. Have any of you watched Star Wars in space? <laughs> no, but I, I would take the DVD if I was going for a long-duration mission, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, good. <laughs> More from the audience? Yeah, hello. Uh, my name's Yolanta Edwards. Um, you all speak English very well but I wondered how you actually manage in terms of communication. Do you all have to learn English, and how do you go about maximizing the way you communicate amongst yourselves? Okay, actually, um, my experience to fly on my first, as I said, international flight was uh, flying with a French cosmonaut, and he uh, had to learn Russian language, and he spoke very well in Russian. My second flight was uh, with British astronaut, and in the middle of the flight, uh, Austrian astronaut came. So I would like to learn all, all languages of people I flew with, but unfortunately, uh, in this case, I wouldn't have any time for training for space flight. Uh, so uh, I think the tradition we have, uh, we had before, was that uh, hosting country will teach uh, guests with uh, their language. When I was uh, training for shuttle flight, I had to learn not only English language, I had to learn NASA language because it's really <laughs> different. <laughs> uh, 
I, I remember the surprise of my f uh, friend when they came to Russia and saw a book of acronyms, not book, several pages of acronyms uh, we use in our program. And I, I can understand how difficult it was to handle not only language itself, but also all this special technical jargon. Uh, then I faced exactly the same when I came to NASA and started to learn NASA jargon. Uh, but um, in flight, uh, now for International Space Station, each of us uh, study each other language. Uh, Americans study Russian language, we study English language. And among ourselves, uh, of course, no, no one is perfect in each other language, but as a crew, I think we're close to be bilingual. So if ground tell us something and through static and uh, noise and noise on the station, you can't uh, understand something in, in foreign language, then your, your partner will help you. And vice versa, if someone was told from Russian mission control and he uh, did not understand, I can explain it to him. So as a crew, we were uh, almost bilingual, uh, but among ourselves, uh, we spoke, uh, we had another jargon word uh, to, to speak, Runglish, mixture of Russian <laughs> and la English language, and uh, if I don't have, can find good word in, in English, then I can say Russian and my partner will understand and vice versa. So we spoke a mixture of languages. And, and if you are not uh, neither Russian, neither American, then you need to be trilingual. Uh, actually, <laughs> in Europe, the position is very simple. English is a must in the astronaut selection. And once you are selected, you need to learn the other language uh, if you you need to learn both uh, Russian and English uh, well. All European astronauts master English and Russian because the only seats that are available for European astronauts to go in, sp in space today are either uh, a seat on the space shuttle or a seat on the Soyuz. Yes, at the very first time I think it's unfair because uh, we had uh, 36,000 candidates that want to be an uh, astronaut in Korea. And then in the middle of the test, we had an uh, English exam and an uh, English interview. So some of the candidates complain about that. Uh, speaking English is really independent of the space flight. But our committee said to us, uh, we had arranged to go to the space with the Russian Soyuz. So you should speak Russian. But uh, in Korea, there's few people who can speak Russia's Russian, so we uh, think about uh, speaking English is a little potential to uh, learn the Russian faster than others. So we should speak English well, but right now I think it's also a very good chance because to, fl to fly to space, I should learn Russian. But right now I can uh, say that uh, thanks to the space flight and then training, I can have a Russian, but unfortunately after six months, I all, maybe I forgot all of them. <laughs> in Korea, I don't have to speak in Russian. But uh, I totally uh, agree with uh, uh, Sergey because it's a little different because I met the stu uh, friends who is major in Russian language. And then they said to me, some kind of words is really, really simple for them, and it's really uh, some kind of like, um, they should know that if they measure, if they learn the Russian. But I don't know, because I learned the Russian in training center, so it's very, uh, very specialized to the space flight. But sometimes I ask, uh, I said some words in Russian, but they don't have any idea about that because it's really, really uh, technical, terminalized. And then it was one more ridiculous thing is that in GCTC, there's so many guys than women, right? So, but Russian language is a little different from Korean because they have a different ending of the language for the women and guys. So I always hear, hear from the guys. So I imitate the guys' words. So some friends of mine in Russia, in Moscow, they said to me, you, uh, you talked in Russian like a military guys. So, <laughs> so always when I understand, I answer like that. I should have said, no, but I always said that, 
Japonia <laughs> like that. So it's a very unique experience. And then I think uh, for the space flight is one more option is the getting more language. Yeah. Well, Japan also has the same situation. We have to learn both uh, English and Russian. Because uh, those are the, uh, the basically the major rocket system that carry human beings. Yeah, maybe we have to learn Chinese soon. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I have a small anecdote, uh, technical anecdote. On my second space flight to Mir, I had uh, taught to my American colleagues uh, the cosmonaut song in Russian. And the plan was to sing that song before closing the hatch before departure, departure of the shuttle of the, the orbiter from, uh, from the Mir. And we forgot, we were too much moved. And as we stationed uh, 400 feet away from Mir uh, for a test of a rendezvous sensor, uh, we realized, by the way, we forgot to sing the song. So we decided to sing through the, uh, the radio that is on board Atlantis. And I have the recording, it's very poor quality, very bad. I mean. Uh, and I was explained on the ground that the U.S. Uh, the, the radio on board the U.S. space shuttle was designed for U.S. accent, spoken accent, the bandwidth, the, the bandwidth. Uh, and I was told this is why when you speak English and you have a strong accent that is not U.S., it may not go through well. And if you sing on top of that, that's even worse. <laughs> and for the ISS, the design of the bandwidth for the the radio communication has been designed on purpose to accommodate accent from other partners of ISS, more than not just US, but also Russian, Japanese, European. And maybe a maybe few words more about uh, languages. Uh, it seems like it would be easier to uh, make one single language uh, spoken on the station. Uh, but what we found uh, when we start preparing actually to our first mission that sometimes to have two different languages is not because of the pride of each country or pride of uh, crew members uh, to use own language. It, it has very big technical reason. Uh, like if you fly on Soyuz, all procedures, not only procedures, uh, libraries of technical books are written in, in Russian. So if you start to translate it, this is a very high probability of mistakes. So we decided that when we fly Soyuz, we speak Russian. When we fly shuttle, we speak English. On the station, we have a mixture of languages. But being able to read both languages, um, I remember, I think, for, for this first assembly mission, uh, I was asked, well, you're flying on shuttle, so you will be provided uh, with um, English procedures. Uh, do you want? have something uh, translated to Russian or not? And I said, no, I don't want to, because uh, sometimes if you have basic knowledge of the language, it's better if you read original text, rather than you have translation and you have mistakes in this translation. So for a while, probably we will stay with uh, at least two languages. Maybe we need to learn other languages soon. Thank you. Um, we have time for probably two more questions. They're short questions. Okay. Mm. Hello, I'm Jack Dove from England. My question is, um, with the short t amount of time, the Virgin Galactic will um, offer during flights for weightlessness five or six minutes. And it's, um, I've seen in many ways astronauts enjoy zero G doing aerobatics or looking out the window. I mean, do you, do the um, couple who plan to celebrate their honeymoon in space, will they, um, <laughs> will they be driven? Will they be driven by? Do you feel you'll be driven by the clock in any way, or do you already um, feel um, the, or do you already have some um, weight planned out to enjoy uh, the zero gravity, or um, do you feel to just? Um, I think we're getting the general gist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's wonderful to see the the masterful United Kingdom understatement try to grapple with the concept. <laughs> in a public endeavor. I think that uh, we might smooch, but I think the main point is just enjoying the view. And But my wife can provide her own answer. <laughs> that was a pretty short question. Go ahead. Thank you, George. 
Okay. Uh, my name is Yuki Takahashi from UC, uh, Berkeley, California. I have a somewhat related question. First, to the experienced astronauts. Um, if you have any advice for people like George, Loretta, and many of us who may only have a few minutes in space, and if uh, you, George, Loretta, have any response to their advice. And any advice for us, first timers? I would say the view of the Earth first. Take pictures and video because that's the only thing that remains after to share with friends and, or to remember. As you see the picture, you remember, ah, yes, I remember I was there. I, I, this happens when we are there. We are flying over such places. So take pictures, take pictures and uh, share music. If you can wear, uh, you know, some good music that you listen as you look at the earth, uh, same for both. Uh, you know, for, for <laughs> no, music is important. And, uh, <laughs> It's only after my first flight that I was told that we can actually have small loudspeakers, so you don't need to have your your, your earpiece in, uh, all the time to, to have music with you. But it's it's nice to hear some uh, music you like when you work hard or when you just uh, eat and look at the window. Uh, my advice would be uh, try to enjoy uh, the flight and actually remember that the excitement start uh, not when weightlessness start it start long before you take off the ground so try to uh, enjoy everything including training preparation to the flight and flight itself of course uh, my recommendation is to feel gravity uh, actually in space no gravity and then come back gravity so that is the one that, uh, of course, other than you can see the beautiful uh, home planet. So the gravity issue and also the CD, the Earth, is the one that I really would like to recommend. Yeah, OK. Um, I, oh, I totally agree with the, uh, Jean Francis because uh, all the instructors said to me, don't be shy to ask to take a photo to other astronaut. But actually, in uh, ISS, sometimes I'm hesitate to ask other people to take a photo of me because they look so busy. But until now, I regret sometimes because I should have taken a photo in some place. But at the time, I'm afraid to ask because they look so busy. But I should ask because I should have that photo. So please. Uh, I don't think it, it will not be a reason to fight each other. So <laughs> please ask any time if you want to make a memory, you should take a photo. Thank you. And maybe, maybe one more thing is take a small uh, radio recorder, MP3 recorder, and keep it uh, recording on all the time and talk. Express yourself uh, also right, uh, right. verbally as uh, you, are, you are experiencing this flight and from the launch, like Sergei says, because the sense of power when you launch is, is, a, is a strong feeling, not, maybe not as strong for suborbital that orbital, but w when the rocket engine will ignite, you, you will feel it and you should say, I, you, man, you should say something and record it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we'll do one last question. There's somebody sitting down way in the back. Uh, the person just raised his hand. I, I've seen you raise your hand about five times and they never got back to you. So we're going to take that and I believe there's another plenary session right after this in here. So we're going to have to wrap up. Yes. Itumeleng Makoloi from South Africa, Department of Science and Technology. Just to the astronaut, I just wanted to ask one question. Did you have to overcome any medical problems? before your missions. Second, it's, uh, have you had, uh, some of you have uh, had, uh, you know, this uh, mission several times. After coming back, did you have, did you develop any kind of medical conditions or problems? Uh, during the selection process of the first Korean astronaut, we should have so many medical examination before our select final people. And then at that time, I realized that in the world, wow, there is maybe over 30 or 50 
medical examination. So at the time, uh, some doctor said to the candidate, it's really, really okay, but it's maybe will be a problem uh, for the space flight. The kind of comment uh, they said to some of the candidate. And then sometimes they said to me, it will not be any problem for the space flight or for your normal life, but you have some kind of like defect on your some kind of place. So I also waiting for uh, the kind of comments from doctor, but for one week uh, for staying in hospital, nobody said, no doctor said to me, you have some defect or you have some problem on my body. So thank God. And then I should appreciate to my parents because I'm totally healthy. So many times in my school, on uh, time, all my uh, friends around me said to me, you are so heavy, you are so fat, and you are so healthy like that, but I couldn't believe that. But after that kind of selection process, I should believe I'm so healthy. And then I have one more, um, one more weird uh, medical problem in my mind, on, in my uh, body, because Whenever I went to the hiking with my friends and then camping, I have no motion sickness in my birth and then train. But whenever I have a business trip, I always have a motion sickness in airplane, in train, in bus. So actually when I had a motion sickness test in GCTC, all the doctors said to me, it's maybe will be a problem for your space flight because you are so weak in a motion sickness. So they uh, expect that you will not uh, be in a chair more than two minutes, a spinning chair more than two minutes. So I, I really was. But in Kazakhstan, in Baikonur, I sit on the chair, I keep in the more than 10 minutes. It's amazing because to go to the space, I should sustain more than 10 minutes. So still I have selective that kind of motion sickness for the trip. I, ha uh, I don't have, and, but for the work, still I have. <laughs> <laughs> See, you should not uh, look at this uh, flight as a business trip, it's more for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I thought, maybe if I thought it's a business trip, I should have motion sickness more severe. Uh, so all the doctors estimate that I will have a motion sickness more than three days. But Actually, I had uh, less than two days, so I think it's not a business trip. <laughs> uh, you know, that actually, since my background is medicine, so I have to clarify the question that you addressed. Like, uh, uh, I think this issue is much better explained by the but situation is, you know that the disease-like situation that all astronaut, cosmonaut may have is different from the disease or, uh, I mean, the medical problem. I don't know if you are asking the medical problems that should, uh, sh uh, uh, will prevent us to pass the criteria or not. Basically, astronaut, we need to pass the, uh, the space shuttle situation, class two or class three medical exam. You, you, should not, you don't need to be a athlete-like condition, like a, a lot of muscle, or you can maybe run 100 meter in certain uh, the, uh, duration or something like that. But you have to be very uh, healthy. That is different from the situation that you will have, let's say, motion sickness, or etc. Because motion sickness used to be said motion sickness, now it's said space adaptation syndrome. Like, for example, everybody, even if you say, I don't have jet lag, if we examine your body system, temperature, is different and also you everybody should have some jet lag more or less same we are adapting to the uh, earth environment so if we are launched in the different environment our body needs to acclimate ourselves so during that uh, adaptation duration it may develop some of the disease like conditions but it's not necessarily 
called it's a medical problem. So that's, that's the situation I really would like to clarify. Thank you. I think you can, you can add more <laughs> since. Oh, yeah, the yeah. So We do have to, to wrap up here, but I'd like to thank the audience for coming and thank you for the questions that you've asked our panelists. And thank you to Richard Brook, who has put together this panel and is uh, joining us again. Uh, thank you very much for bringing everyone together. Yes, let, uh, let me add my sincere thanks to the whole panel. We really do appreciate such an entertaining couple of hours. You've done us proud. Thank you. Now, to the audience, uh, we just have a short pause, and then Kelvin Long is going to deliver the final highlight lecture of this Congress, looking at interstellar drive and other future propulsion concepts. So uh, hold on for just a moment or two and we'll